10 minutes ago, but I think he took a little longer than you. All right, for the jury. You may be seated. I'm sorry? I don't have to tell them anything at this point. But yes. Good, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are still in, uh, under the same instructions I have previously given to you. Um, we're going to also provide you with some notepads and pens. Uh, Mr. Medina, again, who is the uh, bailiff who will have you in charge. Uh, he's going to hand those out. You're not required to take any notes, uh, but if you wish to take notes, you may. Uh, all your notes will, will remain in the jury room when you um, leave for the day. And at the conclusion of trial, uh, Mr. Medina or one of our bailiffs will ensure that uh, your notes get shredded. Okay. And just remember that if you do use uh, uh, notepads and do take notes, that they are for your own personal use. They are not to be considered as official transcripts. You'll get some additional written instructions on how you can utilize those notes if you do take notes at the conclusion of the presentation of evidence. So the state and defense have announced ready. Uh, Mr. Alanis, uh, you ready to? Yes, Your Honor. This? this is the state of Texas versus Juan David Ortiz. Yes. It's on green? No, 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 the light. Yes, on green. Okay, so. Test, 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 can you hear me? In the name and by the authority of the state of Texas, the grand jurors, duly elected, duly selected, organized, sworn and impaneled as such for the county of Webb, State of Texas, at the July-December term, 2018, of the 341st District Court, sitting in for the 406th District Court, of said county, upon their oaths, present in and to the said court, that on or about the third day of September, 2018, and interior to the presentment of this indictment, in the county and state aforesaid, Juan David Ortiz did then and there, intentionally or knowingly, cause the death of an individual, namely, Melissa Ramirez by shooting Melissa Ramirez in the head with a firearm. And on or about the 13th day of September, 2018, Juan David Ortiz did then and there intentionally or knowingly cause the death of another individual, namely Claudine Luera, by shooting Claudine Luera in the head with a firearm. And on or about the 15th day of September, 2018, Juan David Ortiz did then and there intentionally or knowingly cause the death of another individual, namely Griselda Alicia Cantu, a.k.a. Griselda Hernandez, a.k.a. Griselda Alicia Hernandez, by striking Griselda Alicia Cantu, a.k.a. Griselda Hernandez, a.k.a. Griselda Alicia Hernandez, in the head with an unknown object and shooting Griselda Alicia Cantu Hernandez in the neck with a firearm. And are about the 15th day of September, Juan David Ortiz did then and there intentionally or knowingly cause the death of another individual, namely Humberto Ortiz, a.k.a. Janelle Ortiz, by shooting Janelle Ortiz in the head with a firearm. And all of the murders were committed during different criminal transactions, but the murders were committed pursuant to the same scheme or course of conduct. Count two, and the grand jurors aforesaid upon their oaths do further present in and to said court that on or about the 14th day of September, 2018, and interior to the presentment of this indictment in the county and state aforesaid, Juan David Ortiz did then and there intentionally or knowingly threaten Erica Peña with imminent bodily injury 
and the defendant did then and there use or exhibit a deadly weapon to wit a firearm during the commission of said assault. And the grand jurors aforesaid on count three upon their oaths do further present in and to the said court that on or about the 14th day of September 2018 and to the presentment of this indictment in the county and state aforesaid, Juan David Ortiz did then and there intentionally or knowingly by force, intimidation, deception, restrain Erica Pena hereafter styled the complaint without her consent by restricting the movements of the complainant, namely by grabbing her upper body and blouse. And Juan David Ortiz did in there recklessly expose the complainant to a substantial risk of serious bodily injury by pointing a firearm at the complainant. Count four. And the grand jurors aforesaid upon their oaths do further present and into the said court that on or about the 15th day of September 2018 anterior to the presentment of this indictment in the county and state of aforesaid. Juan David Ortiz did in there intentionally flee from trooper John Henry Bradshaw, a person the defendant knew was a peace officer who was attempting lawfully to detain the defendant against the peace and dignity of the state. And to new charges? Not guilty, Your Honor. You may be seated. You may be seated with your opening remarks. May it please the court, counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will show that on September the 14th of 2018, the women in Laredo who County, work Texas, as were prostitutes scared. on San Bernardo Avenue in Laredo Webb County, Texas were scared. They were scared because two of their friends had been found dead, Melissa Ramirez and Claudine Luera. One of those women that was scared was Erica Peña. On September the 14th, Erica had been laying low for about 10 days. The evidence will show that she needed money, so she decided to go out to the boulevard on San Bernardo to go look for work. It was nighttime, and she went to a bench, a bus stop. As she sat there, she could feel the sprinkles of rain coming down and hitting her face. It was around that time that she sees it, the white, shiny, four by four Dodge truck. She knew that, that was truck. David. She knew he she was She will come here and she guy. will tell you. He was nice. That was David. Handsome. She knew he was a military guy. And tall. He was nice. And he would give her money. Handsome, kind. The evidence tall. will show that he pulls up to the Bus stop. And he would give her money. The window rolls down. Hey, babe. The evidence will show that he pulls up Get to in. the bus stop. The window rolls down. She'd been with him at least four or hey, five babe. times before. Get in. So she decides. Okay. She'd been with him at least four or five times before. The so evidence will decides. show that David knew the routine. Okay. First, go buy her her fix. The evidence will show that David knew the routine. Go get the heroin. First, After go buy her her fix. Go buy his tallies. Go get the heroin. After you did like that, tall boys is what. Go buy his tallies. Usually like. Three After they like buy the drugs, tall boys is what. After they buy the beer, like. They're driving. One of Erica's After rules. After they buy the drugs. You, after they buy the beer, she doesn't like to go far. They're driving from the downtown One of Erica's area, rules, she'll tell you, and she notices she doesn't like David to go far driving from the downtown away. area. For she safety. asks, "I don't want to go far." And she notices he David invites her to his house on the north driving side, driving further away. And she agrees. She asks, "I don't want to go far." After all, he she invites her to his house on the north side, and she agrees. They get to the after house. After all. She had been there before. The evidence will show on the north side on a street named Burke. They Bert get to Oak. the house. 
It's the a nice house show. where he lives with his wife and his on kids. On the north side, on a street. But the evidence will show that Burke. they were out of town. They it's were a nice house where he lives with his wife and his kids. To come and watch the But the evidence fight. will show that they were out of town. They were here in San they Antonio. They go in there, and she'll tell you how she and puts her drugs out on the table and starts prepping. They go in there, the dope. and she'll tell you how she puts her drugs out Everything's on the table. Everything's fine. And starts prepping. Up until the moment. The dose. That Melissa Ramirez is Everything's name Everything's fine. Up. She was up sad because moment. her friend Melissa had been found dead. That Melissa Ramirez's name comes up. And her other acquaintance She friend, was sad because Claudine. her friend Melissa had been found dead. When their name comes up, and her other she notices that David friend, becomes uneasy. Claudine. Some look comes over his face. When their name comes up, she Starts notices that jittery. David becomes uneasy. She senses, Some look well, comes over his let's face. go outside, have a smoke. Starts getting Calm jittery. things down. This is she the talk of the well, town right now. Let's These go outside, murders have a smoke that have occurred. Calm things down. They go out. This is the talk of the town right now. These murders that have she occurred. Asks, can I borrow your phone out. so I can call my mom? I they want to let her know I'm okay. She asks. The evidence will can show. Can I borrow your phone so I can call my mom? Request. I want to let her know I'm okay. The evidence will show. David appears that nervous. He ignores her request. And he says something to her that just doesn't fit. He says. David appears nervous. I'm afraid. And he says something. To I'm her afraid that, that Melissa may have my just DNA. Fit. I was he one says, of the. Last ones. I'm afraid to be with her. Before I'm afraid she that disappeared. Melissa may have my DNA. I was one of the second to the last, last ones. He says to be with her before she disappeared. And she's like, "Don't worry about it. If you were second with her, to you're the last," her. he says. And she's like, "They go back inside. Don't worry about it. If you were with her, you're with her." She sits at the kitchen table. They go back smoking inside. a cigarette. <clears throat> she sits at the kitchen table. It's at this time that she noticed the look in David's face. It's at this time he's anxious. that she notices. Now, the look. Call it a sixth face. sense. Call it a gut feeling. He's anxious. Suddenly, now, she realizes call it a sixth sense. she's in danger. Call it a gut feeling. The evidence will show. Suddenly, she realizes she becomes nauseous. she's in danger. This overwhelming the feeling of nauseousness and dizziness comes over her that she as the fear nauseous. runs through her body. This overwhelming feeling of nauseousness and she runs out the front door and she vomits. She vomits on the front grass. He comes out. What's wrong? What's wrong? She, she goes, runs out the good. front door and she vomits. Take me back. Take me back. On the front I don't feel good. He comes out. What's he wrong? Offers her, what's wrong? He offers goes, I don't her good. to take a shower. Take me back. Take me back. I don't feel good. He still wants to be with her. He He's offers like, her. I can't. He offers I'm sick. her to take a shower. Take me back. He goes, you need something in your stomach. I'll take her. you to go She's get like, something to eat. I'm sick. She sees the take opportunity. And she, she goes, says, you need something in your stomach. Take I'll take you to go get something to eat. The evidence will show that they drive. She sees the opportunity. Not too says, far take to a Valero gas station. The evidence will show that they drive off of Not too far. To a Valero and gas McPherson station. Boulevard, a real busy, off of the new the Loop type gas station that has a little and restaurant And McPherson area. Boulevard, a real busy. But something's not right. New type gas station. And the evidence will the show that as area. they pull into the gas station, not right. they don't stop in front. And the evidence will show that as they pull into David parks the in gas the back. Station, they don't stop behind a tractor trailer. Practically on the street. David parks in the back. In the dark. Behind a tractor trailer. He tells her, hey, you need to calm down. Practically on the street. You need to calm in down. The dark. Right now, the he evidence her, will show that she down. is in complete survival mode. You need mode. to calm down. Right now, she is the in evidence fear. will show that she is in complete survival Tommy, mode. She thinks, I need to open the door. She is in I fear. need to get out. Calmly. She thinks, I need to open the door. I need to get out. Without warning, all of a sudden, as she sits in the passenger side, David reaches with his arm, his left arm, and there's a gun in her face. He grabs her blouse 
Instinctively, she pulls back, is able to grab the door handle. And the evidence will show that she's able to duck down, pull herself out of her blouse, and leaves him holding her blouse in his hand as she jumps off the white Dodge 4x4. She runs in her bra and pants around the front of the store. We will take you to that store. You will see that video of her coming around the store looking for help. Call it a gift. Putting gas at one of the pumps is a Texas DPS state trooper, Francisco Hernandez. When this woman, all of a sudden, approaches him in her bra and pants, asking for help. She keeps saying, I'm scared. Help me. I'm scared. He's going to get me. You will see, at that time, Francisco Hernandez, with his training and experience, turns on his body cam. He records the entire thing, the encounter that he has with her. You will hear, you will hear him calling, calling it in. First, he will ask for PD, Laredo PD, to show up. Then he realizes that this case may be, based on what she's saying, it may be related to the string of murders that's going on. He calls over to the station. They direct him to a Texas Ranger who's working the case, E.J. Salinas. They patch him through. They give him instructions to bring her to the station. This is just the beginning of how we got here today. Throughout this trial, we are going to bring you evidence. We are going to, yes, we're in Bear County, but through the evidence, through technology, through photos, through videos, and through testimony, we will take you to those dark, to that dark and horrible places that this happened. Through the evidence, we will take you to those last moments. To those last moments of these women's lives. You will have one of the most important pieces of evidence in this case, the video recorded confession of Juan David Ortiz. You will have the ability to see, to hear, and to analyze for yourselves his confession about the murders. But that's not all. That's not all that the state will be bringing you. We will be bringing you crime scene evidence, which includes casings from the crime scene, projectiles taken from the victims, the jackets of the projectiles. We will be bringing you the murder weapon that was used in this case. The analysis and the experts and the ballistic reports and analysis that were done, you will hear from the experts that made the comparisons in this case. We will also bring you video evidence from the different locations that Juan David Ortiz visited around the time before and after the murders were taking place. Going in and buying beer, going in to use a restroom, and you will see in these videos his demeanor and his behavior as normal as anyone else's walking the streets. Walking in, buying his merchandise, walking in, going to the restroom, nothing out of the ordinary. 
we will be bringing you autopsy evidence of all the victims where the doctor will come and tell you and show you the injuries and the causes of death of each victim. We will bring you circumstantial evidence. All of this evidence that, that we will be bringing you, you will be able to see that we will be able to prove the crime or crimes, the scheme, and his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt as charged. This case, the evidence will show, is about a man who betrayed his badge. He betrayed his country. He betrayed his family. He betrayed his community for his own selfish needs. On September the 3rd of 2018, on or about, he murdered by shooting in the back of her head, Melissa Ramirez. We will take you through the evidence to Jeffrey's Road on the outskirts of Webb County where her body was left, right where he shot her. On or about September the 13th of 2018, he killed Claudine Luera. And just like Melissa, ten, the, 11 days later, 10 days later, he takes her near the area where Melissa was killed, the outskirts of Webb County, or of the city of Laredo, and shoots her in the back of the head. We will take you to the overpass at the 22 mile marker in Webb County where on September the 14th he murdered Guiselda Hernandez Cantu. And finally, we will take you On IH 35, the 13 mile marker, where he murdered Janelle Ortiz. All of the crimes you will see and the evidence will show the similar similarities and the scheme. You will see that all of the victims in this case worked in prostitution. The evidence will show that all of the victims had run-ins with the law. They had criminal histories. All of the victims suffered from substance abuse addiction. All of the victims were killed in the similar manner. Execution style, outskirts of the city of Laredo, either on the side of the road or in the shoulder, grassy part next to the road. And the last similarity and connection of all of these crimes was the gun. A 40 caliber HK government issued semi automatic handgun with government issued ammunition. All the murders 
all part of the scheme, all connected. The evidence will show that it was September the 14th of 2018 that Trooper Francisco Hernandez was putting gas there at the Valero when this woman runs up to him and he turns on his, his body cam. He's given instructions to take her to a station. He takes her to the station. When she gets to the station, investigators are already working feverishly and diligently on this case. They're looking for the murderer of Claudine Luera and Melissa Ramirez. They're there, the Texas Ranger, Captain Calderon will bring them to you. They get Erica to the station. This is Erica Pena. When she gets there, she begins the interview with investigators. She reveals her relationship with this guy that she knows as David. She tells him how he's nice. She tells him how he buys her food. She tells him how he buys her drugs. And that she's known him for about five months. What she doesn't know at this time, the evidence will show that he's a border patrol agent, a supervisory border patrol agent. The evidence will show that sometimes when he would pick her up, his shirt would be turned, the polo shirt with the logo would be turned inside out. And when he would pick her up, the evidence will show that he always picked her up in the white Dodge 4x4 pickup truck. She will also reveal some intimate details about their relationship. Personal things that only she knew about David. Which, it in, which includes and included the sexual encounters that they would have. The most important thing that she provides investigators is I know where he lives. I know where he lives. It's near the academy. I don't know the address, but if you take me over there, I'll be able to spot the house. She is able to take them right to his doorstep. That's where I was. And investigators that night were able to see the vomit that was still fresh on the front lawn. The investigators run the, the information through the property rolls. DPS, also through their intelligence, they were able to find out that the house belonged to this man who sits here today. Juan David Ortiz and his wife. That's where he lived. The sheriffs, the evidence will show that the, the, the sheriffs put out a bolo, be on the lookout. Texas DPS troopers, deputies from the Webb County Sheriff's Department begin a search all over Laredo focusing mostly on the boulevard where this type of activity, activity takes place. And we will take you to that boulevard through the evidence. The evidence will show that approximately one in the morning, Trooper John Henry Bradshaw, as he's driving, he looks over to the stripes on the corner of Jefferson and San Bernardo Parked over by the dumpster on the far left side, he sees it. The white Dodge four-door, four-by-four, shiny truck. Trooper calls it in. Another trooper, Aviel Obregón, 
pulls in, they take a tactical position by the, by the pumps. By now, this man is considered armed and dangerous. You will see the body cam video. We will show you the video. You will be there. We will show you the video from the store that was taken by investigators that shows Juan David Ortiz going in to use the restroom. And as he walks out, you will hear and you will see the DPS troopers confronting him from a safe distance, giving him orders. Put your hands up. Stop. Get on your knees. Get on your knees. For more than 45 seconds, you will see Juan David Ortiz moving, swaying, thinking. What does he do? He doesn't comply. He doesn't kneel. He says, you're scaring me. You're scaring me. And then he runs. You will see the video of the chase on foot where he runs to I-35 access road south. Then he turns on a street called Constantinople. When he turns the corner, the two troopers who are behind him, John Henry Bradshaw tried deploying his taser and missed. Obregón's got his body cam and you can hear him huffing and puffing while he's running. You'll see that video. They lose him. They clear the area, they secure everything. Webb County SWAT, Sheriff's Department, gets on scene. DPS gets on scene. They look in all the surrounding areas. The last area that they need to check is the parking lot at the Hotel Ava. They go, they go floor by floor, clearing the floor. There's not too many vehicles there at this time, but they're checking all the doors, they're checking all the hallways. Finally, they get to one of the top floors and the evidence will show and you will see as law enforcement being stacked up make a tactical approach on this black pickup truck and laying down in the back of the truck is Juan David Ortiz hiding from law enforcement. A supervisory border patrol agent hiding from law enforcement. They arrest him. You will see the arrest. You will see the takedown. We will take you there. From this point on, the evidence will show, and this is very critical for all of you to please pay attention to, that law enforcement treats Juan David Ortiz with nothing but dignity and respect. Dignity and respect. You will even hear on the evidence Juan David Ortiz, he tells one of the arresting officers, go ahead, take your trophy shot, take your pick. The response, we're not about that, bro. We're not about that. You will, you will travel with him in the patrol unit when he gets in there. The camera on the patrol car is on. It's, it's a Tahoe. He gets in it, it's on. They are treating him so respectfully that he volunteers. He hears the conversation. Do you see the gun? Anybody with a gun? He says the gun's in the, in the truck in this area or in the console. You'll, you'll hear him. He volunteers that. Luckily, I will say this, through the evidence, you'll see that when he went to the restroom at the stripes, when John Henry Bradshaw saw him, he left his weapon on the door panel of the truck. He didn't get off with the gun. Just that lapse, that moment that it took, he left the gun in the truck. We will bring you that, that gun. 
The evidence will show that they transport him to the Webb County substation. When they get to the substation, they place him in a room. And it's around that time already that, as I told you, the evidence will show that the investigators had already been investigating this case. You will hear testimony that by this time, law enforcement had already made at least more than 30 contacts. That includes phone calls, ma'am, do you know anything? Uh, sir, can we speak to you? People around the street. Law enforcement had already looked at even some other suspects, other leads to other individuals. You'll hear about the intense, intensive investigation, the due diligence that law enforcement was using to find the killer. Nobody was focused on Juan David Ortiz, who during this entire time was working at the Border Patrol Intelligence Center as a supervisor watching the investigation of the murder going on in his own community while in his uniform at work. Phone calls being made, requests, can you check text, can you check license plate readers, vehicles traveling through this area, through that area. Information that would come out of his station. He was there watching all of this, finding out about other suspects being questioned. He gets there and you're gonna see this. We're gonna take you to the to the inter, into, into the interview room. You're gonna go to the interview room. You're going to see the video when it starts at approximately 3.20 a.m. on September the 15th. Captain Fred Calderon and Texas Ranger E.J. Salinas begin the interview. You will see how they put the Miranda warnings in front of him. You will see how he denies to sign it. But he agrees to speak. You will see initially where he denies knowing Anyone denies knowing anything about what they're talking about. Deny, deny, deny. As they continue to present him with questions, what about Erica? We want to talk to you about Erica. And you'll hear him. And you'll read it. And you'll see it. The only Erica I knew was at Gladys Porter High School when I was a kid growing up in Brownsville. He says it. Very critical. And I ask you to focus during this, this portion of the evidence. Focus on the interview. Focus on his demeanor. Focus on his facial expressions. Focus on his hands. What he says, the words that he chooses, the opportunities that he looks for. This is a man who's a supervisor, a veteran. He has a master's. You will see at the initial portion of this interview that he jumps at an opportunity that the Texas Ranger puts right out there in front of him. And he says, do you suffer from blackouts? I do. I suffer from blackouts. You see, since February of 2018, I've been a patient at the VA. I was in Iraq in 2003. I had a motorcycle accident. We're in 2018. He's been a Border Patrol agent for more than nine years by this time, the evidence will show. He jumps on the opportunity when the ranger uses that word blackouts. I've been given all these medications, my anxiety, my depression, my PTSD, that I black out, I wake up, and I'm somewhere that, how did I get here? One time I woke up at Pizza Hut. I don't know how I got there. Um, and you'll see the evidence. I needed to go to the restroom. What were you doing at, at, the, at, at the stripes on San Bernardo and Jefferson? Well, I needed to go to the restroom, but I don't know how I got there. I had a blackout. 
He remembers everything except the most critical parts of the crimes. He even, and you will see, when they show him pictures, hey, there's this flowered purse in your back seat. There's this other brown purse in your back seat. Who do those purses belong to on the floorboard? I don't know. I don't know who those purses belong to. Well, they have condoms. They have syringes inside of them. Lipsticks. Who do they belong to? I don't know. And he says it with a straight face. I don't know. I don't know how that got there. He continues with that. But eventually, through the questions, through the methodical questions that Captain Calderon and Ranger Salinas, remember, they've already interviewed a lot of people. Erica's down the hallway in another room and she's told so many intimate and private information. They also have evidence from two crime scenes that he can't lie anymore. He says, okay, I know Erica. And I pointed a gun at her. But I wasn't going to do anything to her. The evidence will show that the interview goes into the morning. You will see during the interview that there was no intimidation, there's no coercion. They bring them water, they bring them uh, potato chips. He asks for a bathroom break. They let him go to the bathroom. Everything's calm. Nobody's pounding the tables. It's a discussion. Hey, help us out. Help us out. We know you're a good person. You've served your country and we thank you for your service. You're law abiding, you're a family man. Help us out. Maybe they able to reach that one little inkling of softness, if there is any, in his heart. And he says, yeah, I know Erica. Goes into the morning, and about 11.24 a.m., you will see it on the video. The telltale sign, you will see it. He says, can you take off my handcuffs? Take them off. You will see Captain Calderon pause. This is a moment, critical moment, and he, okay, do I take the handcuffs off this guy? Based on his training and experience, he reaches for his key, takes it out of his pocket, takes off his handcuffs. You'll see him rub his wrist, stretch. I did it. What can you tell us? You will see and you will hear through his own words, how he took each woman to their last resting place, how he executed them. You will hear in his own words the indifference, the disrespect, the degradation that he has for these people to justify ending their lives. You will hear the evidence in his own words. I wanted to clean up the streets. And in Spanish he says, these people are mierda. These bitches are dirt. And I was going to get rid of them. Law enforcement doesn't do anything about them. I will. I'm sick of them. That's what he says.
Trooper Cal, uh, tro uh, Ranger Salinas and Captain Calderon says, look, so you've told us about Melissa. You've told us about Griselda. You told us about Claudine. That's three. Is there anything else? You know, that last question that any good investigator asks, right, in a, in a, in a crime spree, is there anything else, Ortiz? He goes, yeah, there's one more you all don't know about. Janelle Ortiz. You all don't know about her. She's, you'll find her in the grass over by the 13 mile marker where we used to have our border patrol checkpoint. Just right there, as you pull over behind the gravel little mound, she's right there. Law enforcement rushes out to the, to the 13 mile marker right behind the gravel mound and Janelle is there shot dead, shot behind the head. You'll see at the end of the video, he says, that's the whole story. But that's not the end of the story. There's moments that are marked in your life. Moments that when they happen, you know things are never going to be the same. Time is divided into two parts, before this and after this. And it takes strong people to continue to move forward no matter what they are going to find. The state knows that you are those strong people and you will find Juan David Ortiz guilty. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I won't be as long or nor dramatic as dramatic as Mr. Alaniz. Um, let me just tell you that everything that Mr. Alaniz just said is not evidence. The only evidence you're going to get is from that stand, okay? It's what he thinks the evidence is going to show, but the evidence is you're going to hear it from over there. I don't know if this thing's on. Um, now, the state also has to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, okay? And they have the burden of proof of bringing all that evidence to you. We don't have to do anything. The defense doesn't have to do anything. So I ask you to bear that in mind because of that long, lengthy opening statement that he just made. Now, uh, one of the things we would ask you to focus on is the investigation that the Webb County Sheriff's Office uh, conducted together with the Texas Rangers. Uh, together with the report writing, the lack of reports, the lack of protocol, and how they, uh, you know, just jump to certain conclusions. Um, it starts with Erica Pena. Uh, beginning September the 3rd of 2018, it was the first murder, right? And so now law enforcement is working and the like. Now on the 14th, Erica Pena does run to a trooper and says, you know, this individual pulled a gun on me or whatever. Uh, and that trooper reports it. And then these officers that are eager to solve this murders uh, start acting on it. And they believe everything that Erica Pena says. Now Erica Pena is someone that is a self-confessed heroin and crack addict daily. She uses like 300 or 400 dollars a day to maintain her heroin or crack addict addiction. Uh, and uh, she prostitutes herself. She has a child. And you know, some women might prostitute their, themselves for their children. <coughs> She prostitutes herself, not for her child that's being raised by a, a relative. She prostitutes herself to maintain her habit. But the police still act on her word like it's gospel. Uh, 
she we've had hearings in this case and when Mr. Ortiz, uh, Mr. Alaniz talks that she wanted to get away she literally said according to her that she heard voices not like oh I got a good feeling you know what I'm saying she was hearing voices that day that she says she was with Mr. Ortiz and reports to this trooper that she was assaulted. And uh, these individuals bought it hook, line, and sinker and acted on it. And it's just a focus on the investigation. Now, they put out a bolo, which is a be on the lookout for uh, the vehicle that Mr. Ortiz is driving and it's this white uh, Dodge four-door Ram uh, pickup, a 2015, I think. Uh, one of the troopers locates this vehicle at a, at a Circle K. They're off San Bernardo, I think, in Jeffries. I'm not too sure. So, so I think it's San Bernardo. So he gets there, and he waits for another trooper to show up. And when Mr. Ortiz comes out, They've trained their pistol on him, and once got a, a military rifle pointed at him. And they're yelling commands at him. Uh, and he panics, and he runs. Okay. He runs. Eventually, they find him hiding in this bed of a pickup, the SWAT officers. Now, in the interim, while the... DPS troopers are asking him questions. They ask him, is that your pickup, the white Dodge Ram? And he says, yes. He doesn't abandon the truck. He doesn't say, oh no, that's not my truck. He says, that's my truck, okay? Once he's arrested, at some point, the DPS starts searching the truck there in the parking lot of the Circle K and you're going to see that the doors are wide open. There's photographs of that. Uh, to this day, we don't know who took those photographs because the crime scene investigator that's in charge of this denied taking those photos. So we still need to figure that out. Uh, so they start searching it without a warrant. And basically, the law says that to search your property, my property, anything, especially when you assert an interest in it, you should get a warrant. And you may get a jury charge where the judge says, you decide if that search was proper. Um, they transport uh, the truck, you know, the, they call it a wrecker, and they take it to the uh, Webb County substation there in Laredo. Uh, there's been testimony where they claimed that the search was what we call an inventory search. So sometimes what you do is you, you, know, you, you stop a car and you're gonna take it in. You do an inventory. Think about what the word means, an inventory. You wanna see what's in it so that if something's missing later, you've documented there was a briefcase in the back, there was this, whatever. You do an inventory. It's not a search, it's an inventory. Well, lo and behold, you find where the, the, the record driver, uh, different Webb County officers acknowledge no inventory search was conducted. But, you know, but we know a search was conducted because we have the photos. Uh, the two individuals that are supposed to be in charge of this investigation is Texas Ranger E.J. Salinas a Captain Federico Calderon of the Webb County Sheriff's. We haven't heard from Salinas, but we heard from Calderon. We said, well, you said it was an inventory, but here we have this thing that it was inventory. I don't know. Uh, Your Honor, you know, with all due respect, I, I'm going to raise an objection in proper opening. Uh, he's bringing evidence from other hearings to to this jury, I think it is. Just give it to what you expect. The evidence to show yeah. in this case, sir. Well, the evidence is going to show because if he doesn't answer that, we will impeach him with that. We have the record, okay? So that's what the evidence is going to show. Um, so then they have the truck now at the, at the storage facility. It's a secure place. It's not going anywhere. And 
they search it again without getting a warrant. Okay? And they collect evidence from it. Uh, and, and that too, all of us have a right, a Fourth Amendment right, to not have our items searched, whatever it might be, without due process, which would be for the police to go to a neutral magistrate. Police are police. They want to do stuff, right? They want to get evidence on you. But that's why we usually have a neutral magistrate review it and say, oh, yeah, you have the right to search this vehicle or I'm this sorry, house. Or I'm going to uh, uh, object. He's discussing uh, issues about law. He's talking about applicable legal well, the jury will get issues. Uh, an instruction from the court after all the evidence has been presented in the jury charge that will include any law applicable in this case. But at this point, just it's opening remarks, as Mr. Perez mentioned as well. And I conclude with this. Okay. And the reason is you may get a charge from the court where it's going to tell you, you decide if this subsequent search, which was a search, was proper because it was without a warrant. Because there is law that says what exactly what I'm saying. And so the court may instruct you, because you are judges of the facts, and the judge may instruct you and say, hey, you got to decide whether that, that was proper. And, and then if it's not proper, you are not to consider that evidence. That's why that's important, okay? Um, there was a, there's, you're going to find, unless it changes, that the evidence is going to show that to date, no one knows how they got into the truck. You know, most of us, we walk into a convenience store, at least I do. I take my keys. I lock my truck. You know, and uh, the evidence so far, and the evidence may be that to this day, we don't know how they got into the truck. And again, it's because we're focusing on the investigation. Now, we move to the interview or the interrogation, more properly stated, of Mr. Ortiz. So they transport him. Uh, there are several SWAT officers that. Uh, at that parking lot arrest him. They say that they patted him down. Nobody mentions the truck keys. Uh, there is a video of him being transported and uh, Ortiz does mention a weapon that's in the truck. Okay. Now, they have him all ready now by about 2.51 in the morning they have him in the interview room. You know, they start talking to him, and then uh, one of the, either Calderon or Salinas, reads him his rights. Now, of note, is something very important. On the video, and you see this video, when they're arresting him over at the garage, right then where they, you, you go into custody, one of the deputies starts reading him his rights, you know, and the supervisor says, no, don't do that because they want him over here in a controlled environment where he can't assert his rights. And so you see the video where they started to read him his rights out at the scene, and then a supervisor stopped it. He says, no, don't do that. Now they have him in a controlled environment. They're videotaping him. They read him his rights, and it's a typical way that they do it, you know, tra tra tra. And then they ask him, do you understand your rights? Yes. But they don't ask him, do you waive your rights? Understanding them and waiving them are two different things. And you see on the video that they don't ask him, do you waive your rights? And I think you're going to hear from the detective, it's not like they forget to ask you. The evidence is going to show that it's, method, it's by method, but it's by, by, by necessity on their part that they don't ask you if you waive your, your rights. Regardless, he's there. Like Mr. Alanis said, he tells him, look, I'm a war veteran. I was in Iraq. You know, uh, he's been out for a while. He's been successful. He has a wife. He has kids. He rose through the ranks of the Border Patrol fairly quickly and became a supervisor of the intelligence unit. Now, the intelligence unit, all law enforcement has them that I know of. SAPD, SAPD has an intelligence unit themselves. And they usually the idea is intelligence knows more than your average <laughs> Joe out here, uh, police officer in the street, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be intelligence. Um, so, but he does tell them, I'm a war veteran. 
Several months ago, I started having nightmares. I started having post-traumatic stress disorder. I couldn't sleep. I went to the VA. And they gave him a, bot a bunch of uh, psychotic pills. And he gave him the name. They're there somewhere. There's a bunch of them. You know, he's under a lot of stress. He starts drinking. Uh, and then, yes, the issue of blackouts. You know, back in February, nothing was happening. He was already having trouble with his memory and the like. Mr. Lanis says that attributed to Mr. The, 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 the Salinas had said blackouts, but he actually, and by he I mean Mr. Ortiz, says, look, I've been suicidal, I've had blackouts, I'm broken, I'm tired. This is a defeated man. He's denying having been involved in these murders. And they hold him from 251, what, seven, eight, nine hours later, at 1125. It's not that they broke him. It's that Calderon or Salinas say, hey, we'll, 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 he's like, man, I, I miss my wife. How's my wife? We'll, we'll go get you pictures of her. We'll make sure she's taken care of. Oh, well, well, what about my pension? Will she get it? We'll do, we'll get her the pension. I, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, okay? I don't remember it verbatim. They start promising him things. And then they say, hey, they walk out, they walk back in and they say, the elected district attorney is here. Mr. Isidro Alaniz is outside. We can put in a good word for you. That's the guy in charge of his fate. And they're telling him he is not at the Justice Center, not at the courthouse. He's not a cop. This is a police department area or a Webb County Sheriff's. He's a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. This is the Justice Department over there at the courthouse, not cops. They say he's out there. Mr. Alinis is present in the building. Something along the lines, if you start talking, we'll put in a good word for you. Okay? The DA is present. Help your family. Something along those lines. That's when he shifts. And he starts talking about this murders. And he starts saying things that, honestly, everything had been in the papers. This case received a lot of publicity in, Bear in Webb County. And so everything was in the papers. And on top of that, on this other murder that had occurred, remember, this guy is a member of the intelligence unit. I don't know, and I doubt that they know what information he has or he can get that your average captain at the Webb County SO doesn't. These are state officers. He's a federal officer of an intelligence unit. So God knows what kind of information he can get. And remember, he's broken. He's suicidal. He wants his family taken care of. He doesn't know where he's going to go. And he starts saying, okay, I did it. Uh, all the evidence that you have, including the firearm, no one can come in here and tell you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Ortiz is the trigger man with that firearm that killed these women. You're not going to hear anyone come and tell you that he did it other than this coerced confession that the police got out of him. And this is not the first time that any of you, I'm sure, have heard about false confessions. And so I want you to keep all that in mind. This is actually a war veteran. They ran his NCIC. There's something called an NCIC, National Crime Information Center, Texas Crime Information Center, that runs your record. This man has a clean record. He's a good husband, has children. And he was in a bad situation with the VA giving him these medications that God knows what they do to you. So I want you to listen to the evidence, listen to the cross-examinations, listen to the investigation that this uh, police officers made and uh, I believe you will find Mr. Ortiz not guilty. Thank you very much ladies and gentlemen.
Ms. Day, want to call their first witness? State calls Erica Pena. So we're going to the first. You're under the same oath you took earlier, ma'am? Huh? You're under the same oath? Maybe seated. You took an oath a few minutes ago, right? What? The oath. Yes. You're under the same oath. You may be seated. Let me proceed, sir. Ms. Pena. Good morning. Good morning. Can you please? <clears throat> State your full name for the record. Erica Isamar Peña. I'm going to ask you to please uh, speak or get up close to the mic or move the mic close to your mouth. Uh, please listen to my questions. Answer the questions to the best of your ability. Okay. How old are you? 31. And uh, where are you from? Laredo, Texas. How long have you lived in Laredo? Born and raised. Are you married? No. Do you have any children? Yes. How many children do you have? One. Okay, and how old is your child? Twelve. Okay, does your child live with you? Not right now. Okay. Ms. Peña, do you have a criminal record? Yes, I do. I want to talk a little bit about it. Do you know more or less how many times you've been arrested? Um, several times. Okay. Is it more than five? Yes. More than 10? Yeah. More than 15? Not sure. Okay. Um, you ever been arrested for possession of a controlled substance? Yes. Uh, can you tell the ladies and gentlemen what type of controlled substance you've been arrested for? Probably cocaine or heroin. Okay. And did at the, any of these cases have they ever resulted in a conviction? Uh, guilty. Yes. Okay. And after you were convicted, have you ever been in prison? No, never. Okay. What type of sentence have you received? I was in probation for two years. Not too long ago, I just finished. 
Are you currently under any type of supervision or probation right now? No, I'm done with everything. Okay. What, uh, you ever been arrested for assaulting a police officer, or resisting arrest, or terrorism? Yes. Yes? What about uh, resisting arrest? Yes. What about terroristic threats? Yes. Um, what about any violent offenses? You ever been? Yeah. Okay. Do you suffer from any t type of addiction, Ms. Peña? No, not right now. Have you before? Yes. And what type of addiction is that? Heroin and crack. Okay. Can you tell us or tell the jury, um, well, let me ask you, are you sober right now? I take methadone. How long have you been on methadone? I've been in the methadone a year, almost a year. Okay. And where do you get that, uh, that methadone? Mm, by McPherson. Do you receive services? Yes. Uh, when was the last time you were arrested? If you recall. Probably like six or five months ago. Probably six months. Was that a misdemeanor or a felony? Um, revoked for probation. Oh, okay, so you were revoked for not, yeah. uh, not complying with your conditions. Yeah. Okay. And what does that entail? More drug use? Or you came out dirty? No. I I just didn't go uh I just didn't go and report. Okay. How long have you been dealing with this issue of substance abuse or how long have you abused heroin, crack cocaine? I started when I was uh twenty one on and off. And you're 31 right now? I'm 31. So is it fair to say that for 10 years you've been dealing with this yes. issue? Okay. And how were you able to support this addiction? Um, many ways. Um, working in the streets, that was one. Um, Now it's okay, Ms. Peña, um, and I know this may be difficult, but uh, when you say working the streets, what? please tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what that means. Escorting. Escorting? Yes. And when you say escorting, what does that mean? Um, working for money. And when you say working for money. Having sex. For money. For money, yes. Okay. And how long had you been doing that? Um, on and off. Six years. You started in your early 20s? I started when I was 23. Okay. Now, on September the 14th, of 2018. Yes. That was a few years ago now, right? Yes. Were you working at that yes. and doing that? Yes. Okay. Do you know why you're here today? Yes. Do you know a person by the name of Juan David Ortiz? Yes. Or David Ortiz? Can you identify him here in the courtroom <laughs> or what he's wearing? You can please point to him. Do you see him? Yes, in and black. In black? And from where you're sitting, his, his, he's sitting, see, seated in which chair? In the corner. In the corner, okay. So, what do you know him as? What, what, what did I knew him as? Yes. David was a friend. Now, in September of 2018, 
you remember that day? September. September the 14th of 2018. Yes, I do. do you remember that day? I want to go back to that day. Okay. So you're in September. Before that. Yeah. How long had you known David? I want to say five, six months. Okay. So you, you knew him as, as early as five or six months before. No, I want to say five okay. months, six months. Okay. okay. Somewhere okay. around there. Okay. And since the first time you met him, he was a, a client? I, I guess you can say that. Okay. The first time. Okay. I want to focus now on what happened on the 14th, okay? Mm hmm Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, on that day, where were you? On San Bernardo. Okay. And, San, and on San Bernardo... Yeah, it was a very rainy day. Okay. And um, what were you doing, or what were your thoughts? I was sitting, I was standing up, actually, um, a block from TKO, right in front of a small motel. Near a bus stop? Yes. And was it nighttime? It was, no, it was daylight. Still daylight? Yeah, it was daylight. Was it getting, starting to get late in the afternoon? No, it was early. Okay. And that, uh, what if anything happened at that time? I hadn't seen David um, in a while. I was mad because David had broken my phone. I was staying at a hotel. I... How long had you been at the hotel? Like a month. Okay. Before that day, had you been working the days before? Mm. Yeah. Which days before that? Probably in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Not too early. Had you heard anything about any anybody being found dead? By that time, yes. And how did you feel about that? Scared. Because um, nobody knew who it was. How did you? Every, everyone was, all the girls was were watching their backs. And... Um, the okay, word was around. Relevance. I'm going to ask you, how, how did you feel? Frightened. Okay. When you say the girls, who are you referring to? Um... Jocelyn, uh, Suhey, um, are these other girls that Patty? Oh, okay, and these are girls that also work on the street, yeah. Okay, all right. So you're standing or seated right there at that corner, yeah. What if anything happens next? What if anything happens? Yeah, well, you said it was starting to rain or it was yeah. raining. Okay. David picked me up. Okay. Yeah. Now, when he drove up, what did he drive up then? In his white Dodge. Okay. Go this way. Okay. My approach. My approach, Honor. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you when I'm what I marked as things exhibit one. Just ask you if you recognize, just if you recognize this exhibit, yes or no? Yes. Okay. And does it fairly and accurately depict what's in there? Is it, is it, is it a true representation of what, yes. what it is? Mm -hmm. okay. Exhibit one is admitted into evidence at this time. 
Can you tell us what, what you see in front of you on stage exhibit one? I see a white Dodge. And who does that white Dodge belong to? David. Have you been in that white Dodge before? Yeah. How many times? I don't recall how many times exactly, but plenty of times. Was it more than five? I think so, yes. More than 10? Several times. Plenty of times. Had he ever picked you up in any other vehicle than this one? No. Okay. How is it that uh, you would arrange to see David? How is it that... Uh, How would you meet up with, with David? Sometimes he would call me. Sometimes I would just randomly see him. So you knew, you knew David for close to five months? Yes. Do you remember how you met? Yeah. How did you meet? I met him a block away from the Evelyn. It was nighttime. You met him a block away from the Evelyn. The Evelyn? The hotel. The okay. hotel. A That's, block away. Okay. In That's the corner. On the corner. Do you remember the street corner? What street it is? It's in the, the corner of the stripes. Okay. Is that Jefferson Street? Jefferson yeah. and San Bernardo? Yeah. Okay. And uh, did someone introduce you to him? No. Tell the ladies and gentlemen how you met him. I was walking and um, David stopped asked me for a ride and I said yes. We talked for a little bit and that first night we ended up in a hotel. And what if anything did you do at the hotel? We had sex. We conversated. Did he give you money? Yes. How much? I don't recall. Okay. After having sex and conversating, what if anything else happened? He drove me home. To your house? Yeah. So he knew where you lived? Yes. Okay. How was, the, how was David? What was his personality like? Very nice, very sweet, very funny, normal guy. Did you ever notice any odd behavior? Never. Delusions? I don't know what happened to him. But you need to answer my question. I know you're nodding your head, but did you ever notice delusions? No. Hallucinations? No. That his mind was not uh, normal? No, never. Did you ever see him depressed? I don't know, not that I recall. Did you ever see him to have anxiety in front of you? No. Anything unusual about no, David? No, never. Okay. Would David do drugs with you? No. But he would take you to the drug house? Yeah. And who would pay for the drugs? David would give me money. He would wait for you outside? Yeah. And what would tell us typically how to, how how does that work? David knew um <clears throat> my drug of choice and um he would wait for me outside and um we would drive around conversate um did 
did you do that on this day, September the 14th? Did he take you to buy drugs after yes. he picked you up? Yes? Yeah. Yes. Did you... Um, did you go and buy beer? Yes. Anything else that you bought? Cigarettes and beer. Okay. You mentioned the Evelyn Hotel. Yeah. Were that... Did you ever go there with him to the other no. hotel? Do you remember what hotel you went with him to? Only one, the cactus. The was cactus. That, okay. Yes. Was that on several occasions to the cactus or just once? I recall once. Okay. <coughs> on the other times that he would pick you up, where would you go? Sometimes we would just drive park in any street, go to a park. Um, okay. On September the 14th, what did you do after you bought the drugs? We went to a store. I got off. I changed because it was raining. Um, he told me we were going to his house. Did you buy anything there at the store? I bought beer and cigarettes. What what kind of who was it beer for? But like for who? For David. And what did you buy? Cigarettes for me and him. The beers, what type of beers were they? But like Okay. And were they the small beers or the big beers? Just regular Tallies? Regular tallies, yeah. Okay. Did you have a purse with you on that day? I had a small purse, a flower purse. Remember what color it was? Pink. Okay. I approach you on it. Yes, sir. I'm going to show you where I'm marking this case exhibits two, three, and four. And once again, I'm going to ask you to just look at them. Go in and hold these and flip through them and see uh, if the pictures are accurate and what's in within the pictures. Yeah, I recall my bag. Well, before that, just can you look at all the pictures? Can you look at uh, number two, number three, and number four? Are those exhibits accurate? Yes. Yes? And you recognize those items in the exhibits? I recognize my bag. Okay. You recognize what's in there, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> States Exhibit 2. For the record, you're offering them? Yes, I'll offer them into evidence, Your Honor. Exhibit 2, 3, and 4, you said? Yes, sir. They'll be admitted into evidence. Too. Thank you. <coughs> Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what's in uh, Exhibit 2? What do you recognize from that photo? Mm, my handbag, my pink flowered handbag. Can you also see it in, in this picture? Yes. Okay. And what do you have in that handbag? I had condoms, some syringes, and I, I don't recall what else I had in there. It's been a while. Did you have that bag on September the 14th when David picked you up? Yes, I did. Okay. What else do you see in here? The tallies. The tallies? Are those the three Bud Lights that you bought for David? Yeah.
After you bought the tallies, what if anything happened next? We drove to his house. Did you agree to go his, to his house? Yeah. Okay. Had you been to his house before? Yes. And, uh, <coughs> you remember where he lived? Yeah. What part of the city was it on? North side. The north side? Yeah. I approach again. I'm gonna ask you if you look at these exhibits. I'm gonna mark these for identification purposes as exhibits five and six. Just if you recognize it, yes or no. Not this one. Not this one. Okay. Do you know what it is, though, inside there? Yeah. Oh, yes, I recognize it. So do you recognize it or not? Yes, okay. I do. Okay. And then what what exhibit are you this is Exhibit 5. Five. I'm going to also ask you the same thing about State's Exhibit 6. Yes. You recognize that? Okay. Ms. Peña, hi. I'm Joel Perez, and I represent, well, I'm one of the lawyers that represents Mr. Ortiz. On this receipt here on State's Exhibit Number 5, I mean, can you read out what it says there, or is it just any receipt that... that it says, um, Powerade, Marble, Bud Light, and the $100 bill David gave me. Do you see the date on them? Where? I mean, I'm asking On you. the receipt? Yes, um, trying to see. <laughs> I can't see it. Oh, down here. September 14, 2018. Okay, and you recognize this receipt from back yeah. then? Or you're guessing? No, I had I went inside that store. I changed and I bought what I bought, and I gave him his change okay. back. Okay, thank you. No objections, Your Honor. To uh, five and six. You're offering them. All right, states exhibits five and six are admitted into evidence at this time for the jury's consideration. <laughs> Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, and you just answered it, but uh, yeah. what did you? buy there I buy bought uh Bud Light, a Powerade and cigarettes. Was it how many Bud Lights did you buy? I can't see. How much did you pay with or what? I ha I ha David gave me a $100 bill. Okay. And what did you do with the change? I gave it back. I'm going to show you States Exhibit 6. Yes. What is that? David's house. You went there that night? September the 14th of 2018? Yes. And prior to that night, had you been there before? Yes, I have. Okay. He had taken you there before? Yes. Do you drive, Miss Pena? 
I know how. Yeah, I, I know how to drive. Do you have a car? No. Have you ever driven to this place yourself? No. How did you previously get to this house? Um, David picking me up. So you get to his house. What, what exactly happens when you, when you get there? Um, I sit on, on the corner of the table. Where? In the in the. In what part of the house? And uh, next to the kitchen. Okay. Is there, there anybody home at this time? No, just me and him. Okay. Do you know if David's married? Yeah, I knew. Okay. Where was his wife? I'm thinking McAllen. Okay. Do you know if he has children? Two. Okay. Where were his children? With the baby mama. Uh, had he told you they were out of town or? Yeah. You're sitting at the table in the corner near the kitchen. What, if anything, are you doing? What am I doing? Yes. I'm dissolving the heroin. I shoot up. Okay. And what what if anything happens next? David goes to the bathroom, comes out with a mouthwash. A mouthwash for you or for him? For me. Okay. And do you do you use No, I didn't use it. Okay. He had asked me to take a shower before um, having sex. Were you able to have sex with him? No, we didn't have sex that night. Um, Up until this point, was everything okay? Up as soon as we entered the house, David wasn't himself anymore. I saw him just not himself, very nervous. Mm -hmm. um, how, did, how did he begin to become nervous? What were you all, if anything, talking about? We were talking about some other stuff then. Um, all of a sudden he said that he was afraid that they would check his DNA because he was second to last to be with Melissa. And what was your response to that? What did you I tell told them that if he ha if he didn't have nothing to do, he shouldn't be scared. Okay. So but what else? What if anything do you do next to calm him down? Do you stay mm -hmm. there in the kitchen? I yeah, I started shaking. He noticed me when I got scared. Okay. And what do you do next? Where do you go? I'm grabbing the cigarettes, shaking. Okay. You I grab the cigarettes? Huh? You, you said you grab the cigarettes. Yeah. And do you stay in the kitchen or do you go somewhere No, else? I ask him if he goes with me to smoke outside. Okay. And um, we're outside and... What if anything happens while you're outside? What if anything happens? Yeah. What else happened when you were outside? Um, I sat on a chair because by that time I felt scared. I would, I didn't want to give him my, give him my back. Mm -hmm. Um. Did you have your phone with you? No. I had asked him inside if, if I could call my Thank mom. You and okay. Stay.
um, you didn't have a phone. No, I did not have a phone at that at, time. At any time that you were there, did you attempt to call anyone? I asked them if I could call my mom. Did you call your mom? No. Why not? I think... I think he said, hold on. I'll lend it to you in a bit. Okay. So he, he ignored your request? He ignored my... Yeah. Okay. Do you stay outside or do you go back in? We're outside and um, I tell him I forgot something in the truck and I I head towards the front door and I, as soon as I step outside I start vomiting because I felt very nauseous, very nervous. Why were you feeling nauseous? Why were you feeling nervous? I just, I don't know. I just felt scared and nauseous. What were you scared of? I just got this feeling. What feeling? What was David doing that made you scared? Oh, you wanted that feeling. What, what if, yes. what if anything? Huh? Okay, what if anything caused you to get scared? When he said he was second to last, that kept me. Thinking. Thinking what? That maybe he was the one. He was the one that what? That had been murdering. That was in your head? That was in my head, yeah. Because he had never been nervous. Okay. After you throw up, what happens next? I think I tell him that maybe it's because I haven't, I, ha I had not ate anything all day. Okay. And then what happens next? He says, we'll stop at a, we'll stop somewhere to grab a burger. Okay. Do you leave his house? We Did both get in the truck. He locks his, I think he locked the house and got inside the truck. Before, before you left his house, did, did you, did you complete the act of having sex with him? No. But you were there for that? Yeah. How many times? I don't recall. How, how many times had you been with David sexually? I don't recall. Okay. Is it more than five? No, I don't recall. Okay. Uh, would you, what when you had sex with him was it intercourse or oral sex or what kind of sex? Oral sex, foreplay. Um, Had you ever seen David without his clothes on? Yes. Without his clothes on? Without his shirt, yeah. When when you would have sex, you would be both The naked. first time okay. we went into his house, okay. we laid in his couch. Okay. Did David have any markings on his body? Two tattoos, two hummingbirds. Okay. In his chest. Any other tattoos that you recall him having? Mainly those two. Okay. What is it about? I'm going to show you if I may approach on uh, states exhibit seven and eight. said you had been with David before just to ask you if you seven. I'm showing you exhibit seven do you recognize um, 
what's in that photo? You need to answer verbally. Yes. yes. Okay. And is it an accurate photo of how he looked around that time? Yes. Okay, I'm going to show you exhibit number eight. Is that also an accurate picture? Yeah. Are you familiar with what's in that photo? Another tattoo. Are, are you familiar with what's in that photo? A tattoo. The answer is yes or no. Are yes. you familiar with what's yes. in that photo? Okay. And he had these markings yes. on that day? Yes. And you're offering them? I'm offering them, Your Honor. States, States Exhibit 7 and 8 are admitted into evidence at this time. Okay. So you remember and you testified, you can tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Exhibit 7. Now you could talk about the tattoos. What are the tattoos that he... They look like two hummingbirds, those chuparrosas. Chuparrosas? Se, a mí se ven como dos chuparrosas. So what you're saying is to you they look like two... Hummingbirds. Hummingbirds. Yeah, to me. Okay. Uh, what else does he have? A, f a flag. A sun. Did he have those tattoos uh, with you or on his body when he was with you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is Exhibit 8. Have you seen that two be tattoo before? Yes. And that was when you guys were? Together. Together. Okay. One through eight. Can I publish one through eight to, to the jury, Your Honor? So you're going to go get a hamburger. Tell us uh, what happens next. David parks behind a tractor and just says, wait, hold on. Pulls out a gun. When you say tractor, is that a tractor? A trailer. Tractor trailer? Tractor, yeah. Like an 18-wheeler? Like one of these? No, like a truck driver. Oh, a truck driver, a big yeah. tractor. Yeah. That pulls a box. Yeah. And where does he, is this in front of the store? Uh, behind behind the store. Yes. Okay, and What did what did you why didn't he park in front of the store? I don't know. Okay What if anything happens next? Um, as soon as he uh, Took out the gun he just stared at me didn't say anything. I opened the door Let's back up a little bit. Yeah. How were you feeling when he stopped there behind the store? Nervous. Did he say anything to you? No. I remember telling him if he could go yeah, drop me off. Can we answer the next question? Can we answer the question that's being asked, please? Did Thank you me. say anything to him? <laughs> if he could go drop me off. Drop you off where? Where he had picked me up. So you wanted him to take you back yeah. to where he picked you up on San Bernardo? Yeah. What did he say? He didn't say anything. Okay. So you're, par you're, you're parked there, it's nighttime. Mm -hmm. You're behind the tractor, behind the store. Yeah. Then what happens? <clears throat> Some way, somehow, I took off running without a shirt. Before that, inside the truck, tell us about what you remember when he pulled the gun. He's trying to grab me by my left shoulder. 
Where did he get the gun from? Had you seen the gun? I had not seen it, no. What, if anything, did he do with the gun? He just pointed it right at me. When he pointed it at you, show the ladies and gentlemen of the jury where he pointed to you. Right here at my face. Right at your, hold up your hand and, and show us how. Just like this, with his left arm with his left arm yeah he put the gun next to your face yeah what else if anything did he do while he's pointing the gun with at his your face? right <coughs> arm trying to hold me back from not getting off how did you get away I took off running. I snapped. Mm -hmm. You got off the truck, you said, without your blouse. Yeah. What happened to your blouse? I don't know. How did you lose your blouse? I don't even know. Everything would happened so fast. He stayed with your blouse? I don't know. Did you pull off your blouse? Some way, somehow, I um, got out that blouse. What did you do after you got off this truck? I run to the store and there's a trooper. I'm crying hysterically. I'm sorry? Repeat that? I run to the store and there's a trooper putting gas. Okay, and what do you do? I go up to him. What do you what do you tell him? That um someone had just pulled out a gun at me. What were you feeling at this time? Nervous, shaking. What did you tell the trooper, if you remember? That we were at his house and um, that we were at his house and um, I got scared. I ran outside, we went to the store. Were you afraid he was gonna hurt you? Somewhere in my mind, I had those thoughts. I don't know how, but I did. What did the trooper do after you asked him for help? He's freaking out, <laughs> he's freaking out. Um, he takes me to the police station. What happens when you get to the police station? I tell them my story. Okay. Do you remember how many officers you were speaking to? Like three or four. Okay. What do you tell them? That um that I knew David and that he had pulled out a gun at, at me. Okay. Did you Provide any other information about David? Yeah, I told them where he lived. Okay. And how were you able to tell them where he lived? They took me and I pointed at his house. Okay. Did you know the name of the street? By that day, I don't remember now, but 
that day I did look at the streets and all I said is remember this street. Okay. So that night the officers take you to the neighborhood and you point out the house. Yeah, I recognize it right away. After you show them the house, what happens next? I think they start pulling up pictures. And I said, yeah, that's him. At that time, September the 14th of 2018, did you know where David worked? Yeah. Where, where did you know? I knew he was a supervisor with Border Patrol. Okay. Did you know that from the very beginning? You met him five months ago? Not from the very beginning, no. At the beginning, where did you think he worked? (coughs) Did you know he was law enforcement the first time you met him? No, not the first time, no. When did you find out he was law enforcement? One time when he took me to go score. He had a, the shirt inside out. He got off. And um, he had a shirt inside out. Please describe to the jury what does that mean? The uniform inside out. And that's the day I found out. He told me that he was a border patrol. Did you also have any personal knowledge of David being a client of any of your friends? Excuse me? Did you know if David was also a client of some of your friends? Melissa. I didn't know about the, I didn't know anything about the rest. I knew he was friends with Melissa. You know how long he had been friends with Melissa? Not exactly the time, no. Okay. Did he ever talk to you about Melissa? Yeah. Do you know if he was seeing both you and Melissa? Yeah. At the same time. Yeah. Around the same time. Around was, the same time, yeah. He was seeing both you, and do you know if he was also seeing Melissa? Yes. Okay. Do you know if he would take Melissa to buy drugs? Uh-huh. If you know, if you know. I don't recall that. Okay. Had you seen him picking up Melissa before on the boulevard? I think before meeting him, I saw his truck. Melissa had short hair. She was sitting under a tree. By that time, David didn't know who I was. So he knew Melissa longer than you? Yeah. Had you ever seen Melissa at the county jail? Yeah. Yes. How long did you know Melissa? Quite a while. What is quite a while? A couple of years. Okay. Are you familiar?
show you when I mark the state's exhibits. Nine, 11, and 12. And I'm just going to ask you if you recognize yeah. this person in this picture. recognize this person in this picture? Yes. You know her? From the streets, yeah. Do you recognize the person in exhibit 11? Yeah. Do you recognize the person in exhibit 12? Yes. These women were all friends of yours? Yeah. No objections, Your Honor. offer these, Your Honor. All right. State's exhibits 9, 10, 11, and 12 are admitted into evidence at this time. So you knew Melissa for how long? Four years. Did she also work on the street? Yeah. Did she also abuse drugs? Yes. What about Colleen? A year or two. She worked on some of the night? Yes. Not, not Claudine. You said that them too? Years. For years. Was she a friend? Yeah, years. Since I started. Since you started when you were 23? 23, yeah. Okay. And did she also use drugs? Yes. What would you call her? Chelly. Chelly? Yeah. What about this person? Janelle. How long did you know Janelle? Years. Was she a friend of yours? My best friend. And would she also use drugs? Yes. Was she also arrested a few times? Yeah. As your best friend, would you all hang out? Or what would you do? Me and Janelle, the same. Walk, make money. Outside of that type of work, did you guys hang out? Yeah. Janelle would go to my house. What type of person? Hang out, funny. As to the last question, what type of person she was? Well, I mean, I want to make sure he doesn't get into. Overruled on that question, you can urge it if you need to. Janelle was funny. Yeah, Janelle was funny, but very caring, had a lot of friends. Her personality. Yeah, was outstanding. You know Chetty's personality? How was she? Was she? Very calm. A calm person. Was she peaceful? Calm. Yeah, very calm. What kind of person was Claudine? Very calm. Did you ever have any interactions with her? S I don't know. I don't recall how many times, but uh, a couple of times. Okay. Never had any problems with her? No. Okay. And what about Melissa? What kind of person uh, was Melissa? Funny. Um, okay. 
very funny. Um, she was fun to be around. Yeah, she would lighten up. She entered a room. Um, I want to continue where we left off, and that was when you said that once you showed him where where he lived, you go back to the station. They show you pictures. They they investigate the the house. You said they show you a picture. You identify him as the person. Uh, and what what happens after that? Like three four hours. Mm -hmm. um, he gets caught. When he got caught, were you still there? And the police station? Yes. Yes. You were at the police station in a, in a room? Yeah. Okay. Did you have to do anything else that night? No. Okay. Okay. During the time that you knew that he was a law enforcement officer, did he, did he had ever, ever at any time um, go and see you during his working hours? I just answered that question, yes. When he would see, and I'm sorry I didn't hear uh, if it was during his working hours. I know you said that he w had his shirt turned inside out, but during his working hours, he, he would go and see you when he would get out of work okay um any other times that uh, you saw him was he ever in any government vehicles no never okay not vehicles okay um besides that one time when his shirt was turned inside out did he ever go in and visit you with any other type of uniform Not that I recall. Okay. And the times that you went to his house, uh, please describe his house to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Did he have a lot of furniture? Was it very little furniture? Was it it's a, a nice house. Okay. Did you see any family pictures there while you were there? I don't recall family pictures. Did you ever see any photos on the stands, on the tables, on the coffee table? Mm, I don't recall photos at all. Okay. The other time that you went to see that you went to his house, where was his family, if you know? Out of town. How many times did you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury did he take you to his house? Um, probably two. Two times before this last time? Yeah. And on those two other occasions, did you also have sex with him that, those times? The day we went to his house, no. No, but those other previous times you were there, did you shower there? No. Did you have sex with him? No. Did you perform oral sex on him? The other times that you went? No. Did he give you money? Yes. Okay. Other times, did you ever perform or have sexual activities with him in his vehicle? Yes. Where? In the parking area. The parking area of what Walmart, location? Walmart. Um, 
behind the motel. You also would go to the parks with him, you said? Yeah. Okay. Would this be during the day or would this be during the night? Night. Okay. How many times have you recalled that he take you to go score as you say it? I don't recall. He would pay for the drugs? Yes. Okay. We'll pass a witness, Your Honor. Mr. Davis, can you approach him, Mr. Alanis, briefly? All right, so it's uh, it's 1 p.m. We're gonna go ahead and take a, a lunch recess at this point. Uh, I'll ask everyone to please be back by 2.15. Uh, I understand there's a cafeteria here in the building and then there's several restaurants nearby. Um, so I'll ask you all to, again, uh, remind you not to discuss the facts of the case with anyone, uh, not to watch any news account or read any newspaper articles regarding this case. This previous instruction I've given you in the past. And uh, Mr. Medina, can you excuse everyone? Uh, All right, to the jury. To the jury. So, 2.15, please. Two fifteen, yes. We'll start like by two thirty.